thank you. It's an honor to be here. It's my first uh, time to attend this conference and uh, meeting a lot of familiar faces actually uh, here. And so it's great to be here. Um, so what I want to talk about is a little bit about the road to autonomy and what are some of the challenges along the way, really from a technical perspective. Um, so the outline of my talk, first of all, I'll tell you a little bit about TRI, who we are, and what our relationship is with Toyota. Really some of the technical challenges that we see in terms of really truly realizing level four, level five systems in the wild. Our approach to automation within Toyota. And then some of the big questions that remain to resolve. So first about, about TRI. TRI, uh, we were really launched uh, back in January 2016. Uh, we're basically a billion dollar investment behind Toyota basically to, to look at how we can apply artificial intelligence with the general goal of really to improve the quality of human life. And the way we think about this specifically uh, as it relates to mobility is that we think about first vehicle safety. And so uh, someday basically using this technology to create a vehicle that's incapable of causing a crash. We think about access to mobility. And so think about increasing the mobility access for those who cannot drive. We think about robotics actually. And the connection here is to think about, we're talking about mobility at an urban scale we're actually now thinking about what does it mean to have mobility in the home through intelligent assistance. And then finally, to think about the application of uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning in terms of discovery of new, new materials, say material science for, say, new battery chemistries. So with TRI, we have a multi-campus strategy. Um, with the three sites, we are located near three top universities uh, in the world. So in Los Altos, California, located near Stanford, in Cambridge, Mass, near MIT, and in Ann Arbor, near the University of Michigan. And this is by no accident. Uh, we're purposely located near each of these universities and have a, a vigorous uh, kind of research portfolio with each of these partner schools um, where we do re both research as well as talent recruitment. Um, now, at the University of Michigan, where we're located with TRI Ann Arbor, we're just across the street, really, from M-City. And actually, I, I'm happy to announce that today we're, uh, we are one of the founding uh, OEM members to basically financially commit to the American Center for Mobility. Um, and I think John Maddox will talk about that a, a little bit later. But these serve as important testing grounds for us. Um, let me move into a little bit some of the challenges that we see in self-driving vehicles and kind of level set the conversation because there's a lot of interest, obviously a lot of buzz. It's great for us to be talking about this and this kind of new mobility revolution that's happening. I think it's also important, right, to have an honest conversation about what are some of the te technical challenges that still remain to really truly realize some of these systems. So there's a plethora of challenges that remain. There's adoption challenges that I would characterize as being from governmental, you know, legislative to economic issues about employment, employment displacement, ethical, legal, safety, security, cybersecurity, as we, as we heard. Um, but today I'm really going to focus my talk on what are the, some of the technical challenges, even just from an engineering standpoint, that still remain in terms of how we can actually field these systems and problems that are still really hard that we need to solve. Um, but really to ground this conversation, let me first kind of uh, give you an overview of the, the uh, one standard that oftentimes is used to basically talk about and describe these different levels of automation. And this is the SAE J3016 standard, where basically we, we talk about basically five different levels of autonomy, a zero through five scale. Um, it's important to note that while this is a, a, zero, a, a linear progression, right, zero to through five, in no way does it mean that we have to actually approach this technology development in this linear progression, right? It's basically just a way to kind of categorize the different levels of automation. So in a level zero vehicle, this is our traditional vehicle that is basically a dumb vehicle. The human's responsible for all the driving tasks. In a level one system, we basically think of a one degree of freedom that's being under control. So an example of this would be longitudinal control with an adaptive cruise control system. Basically, the human's still responsible for the steering task, but the automation will regulate basically the in-lane speed and distance to vehicles. Uh, in levels two and levels three, we th I'll think about actually having both lateral and longitudinal control under autonomy. And importantly, the human serves as a backup in both these systems. In a level two system, it requires that the human is, is basically continuously vigilant, ready to accept the driving task at a moment's notice and to take over, as well as they play a supervisory role in the system to basically disengage the autonomy if it gets into a situation that it fails to recognize that it can't handle. In a level three system, we think about basically offering the driver to let down some of their guard and, and to um, not have to be as vigilant, maybe to do other secondary tasks, you know, answer emails or read a, a, a tablet. Um, but that the system, the autonomy system basically has to then guarantee a certain time with which the, the, the 
handoff task will come back to the human with the idea that the human will then resume the driving task. And then levels four and five, basically this is where you can think about the human is always a passenger. And when most people talk about deploying these autonomous systems in level four, level five, um, level four basically presumes that there's a restricted operational domain. So oftentimes in practical terms, we'll think about this will be a geofenced application uh, where the vehicle will have the ability to realize autonomy. Level five is basically where we think about an unrestricted capability of the car to drive uh, under nationwide kind of all weather driving scenarios. Um, and our CEO, Gail Pratt, gave a keynote address at the Consumer Electronics Show in 2017. I think we, um, uh, as an organization, are pretty open, I think, in terms of trying to ground basically the, the conversation on this and to be honest about the difficult problems in terms of autonomy and where we think autonomy will first be deployed. So, in, in fact, uh, to quote Gil, none of us in the automobile or INT industries are close to achieving true level five autonomy. It'll take many years of machine learning and many more miles than anyone has logged of both simulated and real world testing to achieve the perfection required for level five autonomy. When we say level five autonomy, what we're really talking about why it's many years off, we're talking about basically a vehicle that's capable as you or I as a human that can drive anywhere, anytime, under any kind of adverse weather condition in any kind of traffic scenario. When a particular company says that it aims to um, deploy autonomous vehicles in the early 2020s, what they're probably most, most likely referring to is really a level four technology where it's gonna be a geofence restricted application. Now, what are some of the difficult situations for self-driving vehicles? Um, so I'm a U of M robotics faculty member. Uh, one of my colleagues, John Leonard, is also a, a MIT robotics faculty member, and he's also a member of the Toyota Research Institute. Um, John's, you know, been a vocal voice of, I think, of reason in terms of kind of tampering expectations and kind of showing, showing basically all these different kinds of scenarios that are, are, are scenarios that really need to be handled to really achieve and realize autonomy from thinking about driving in snow-covered roads in Michigan or the Northeast, um, thinking about the social nuance of left turns across traffic at a busy Boston intersection. Uh, so one of the kind of underlying cornerstones of a lot of the technology that um, has been a, one of the key things that enables some of our ability to uh, realize the Thomas driving technology. It's been the use of high fidelity or HD maps. Um, one of the purposes that these maps serve, right, is basically it allows us to kind of pre-encode in advance a lot of the rules of the road in terms of driving. So if you want to understand, say, a complicated intersection like the one showing up at the uh, upper right there, we can encode some of the, basically the rules of the road. You, you, Sometimes intersections can be even difficult for a human to parse and understand which lane belongs to them. To say situations like this, if this is a sculpture in Poland, right, where um, it basically looks like people emerging out of the sidewalk, right? Well, to your LiDAR scanner on your car, that's gonna give me a point cloud that looks like a collection of people, right? So trying to encode basically a, a lot of information about the environment in terms of expected the expected, expect the expected and try to reason about what's different. One of the challenges though in using these maps is that we need to build, not only build these maps, but as soon as we build them, they're outdated. We need to be able to maintain these maps, right? And this is one of the continual challenges that we have as an industry in terms of thinking about that aspect of this. Now, what does a map buy you? Well, certain things like this. So if I have a map and I know where I am in it, you think stoplight detection becomes easy, right? Because now I can look at the bounding boxes, I know where they are in 3D space relative to my position, and I can then easily improve the robustness of my computer vision algorithms if I'm trying to detect the phase of a stoplight, right? Is it red, is it green, should I stay or should I go? Um, but does green always mean go? So here's an example from a dash cam from John uh, driving around in Boston. And to set the stage here, basically a Red Sox game has just gotten out, okay? And so, uh, as you'll see, this is a red light. If you pay attention to the left, you see there's a cop waving us through a red light. Now, as we're gonna drive up, you'll see we're gonna come to the next block, and it's going to be a green light. And now, I can write a computer vision algorithm, it's gonna say, I can detect the state of the light is green, but do I go? Right there, no. All it took was that, for a cop to step on the roadway and to do this, right? And all of a sudden, the entire context of that scene has entirely changed. This is a very hard problem. It's not beyond our capability to write a computer vision algorithm that can detect somebody doing a pose like this. But it's all the nuance of the scene understanding, right, to realize that this is a real event. Do you want to stop for every teenager that does this? No, right? But there's a lot of top-down situational awareness that needs to be applied to really understand and parse a situation like this. Uh, moreover, there's this 
this social aspect of driving, right? I mean, we've talked about basically this phase change to autonomy, but we live in an adult world where we're going to have robots mixed with human drivers on the roadway. And so for that to, to work, right, I mean, this is an example of our vehicle. And to be clear, this is under manual driving right here, uh, data collection. But Jay basically trying to make a left-hand turn in Boston, okay, at a busy intersection. Some of that social grease of kind of eye contact, right? Uh, what does it mean to basically interpret and, and parse kind of the social cues that allow basically the flow of traffic to happen? Now, in reality, maybe you do something entirely different for Thomas vehicles. You do more like what UPS does. We only make right-hand turns. Right? That's one way to kind of think about avoiding this, but these are some of the questions that we need to ask. Um, I think if anybody tells you that they're going to do this with computer vision alone, uh, that's, that's a hard, that's a tall order. Um, I, we believe very much in a multimodality approach to this, so we think about LIDAR, radar, vision, all being as first-class sensors uh, in the way we try to perceive and understand the world. The reason I say this is what do you see in this picture? We can see a, a glaring sun kind of, we're staring into it, coming to an intersection, uh, do you see the police officer standing there in the middle of the intersection, basically trying to control traffic? So with the multimodality approach, they give you basically complementary uh, different aspects in terms of trying to parse and understand the world. Um, and then finally, you know, what do we really mean in terms of the challenges of guaranteeing level four and level five driving? This is an everyday example, actually. This is me driving into work, uh, and uh, normally I make a right-hand turn to turn into the office, and I see that there's a fire truck like blocking my right-hand lane. And I see that actually there's police cruisers on either side of the intersection. I'll be in a robotics professor from U of M. I immediately whipped up my cell phone and decided, I'm going to use this in a talk someday. And I decided to take a video of it. What had happened is basically a water main had broke. Uh, this was winter in Michigan. And so that road had turned into a river. Now, that's an individually rare event. It doesn't happen that often, right? But collectively across the US, that happens every single day. When we talk about having a level four, level five system, we're talking about the human as a passenger. In fact, the people that we're planning to transport may not even be capable of the driving test, the blind, the disabled, they may be even children of the passengers, right? So I think there's a high bar here in terms of how do we maintain this level of, of uh, understanding and reliability to realize some of these systems. So what's our approach to automation within TRI? Um, we think about uh, three goals. So first is safety and how we can apply AI to basically um, help save lives. And our, if we look at this right, in the US alone, there's about 6 million crashes per year, about uh, 35,000 fatalities. To put that in perspective, that's like a Boeing 777 falling out of the sky every three days, and, which when you think about it, that puts things in context, right? Uh, and when you look at it globally, about a million and a quarter fatalities per year, which is about 11 777s every single day. Uh, moreover, 93% of these accidents are really due to root cause human error, whether it's speeding, drunk, or distracted. So there's a tremendous potential here to think about how we can use automation uh, to improve safety. Secondly, we think about access. And so here we think about uh, basically the aging demographics and basically, you know, that driving right, is such an important social in impact, right, in terms of thinking about mobility and our, and our ability to engage in society. Those plots in the lower left basically show a, a distribution of the demographics in Japan. On the far left, you basically see this pyramid-looking shape, right, which is basically in the 1950s. Uh, we see that there's basically a much younger population, right? Um, whereas if you look at the figure in the far right, we see that that pyramid's now inverted. That's the projection for 2050, where basically we see that about, uh, the projections say that in 2060, about 40%, over 40% actually of the Japanese society will be over age 65. And so to think about that, to really have uh, an aging demographic. Um, and actually, the US lags not that far behind. In the upper right, basically, those plots just basically show that the US, US follows a similar trend, but about 10 years behind. Moreover, who hasn't seen this uh, Google uh, commercial for their self-driving cars? This is Steve Mahan. He's a legally blind man, right? And you see him basically driving around doing the everyday things that we take for granted, picking up his dry cleaning, going to Taco Bell, right? Through access through to mobility. Uh, and then quality of life. So if you actually go back in time, how many of you know that Toyota actually started off making weaving looms? So we are, the, uh, uh, if you go back to the origins of our company, we actually started off making weaving looms. Um, and it was in the 30s when we really pivoted to basically uh, adapting that same technology in terms of our precise precision and manufacturing um, to the automobile space, right? And we, where we've grown to be today, one of the largest automotive uh, manufacturers of high quality vehicles. We're at a, a similar bifurcation point again, where we think about being a maker of intelligent machines. And so we think about mobility both in the urban scale, and this is our first application with vehicles, but we also think about mobility in the home, and we think about robotics and a longer term play on our part to really think about having intelligent assistance in the home. 
Now, within TRI, as our approach to mobility at urban scale, we basically think about uh, one technology stack but two applications. Chauffeur is the goal where we have basically level four, level five autonomy. Human is always the passenger. But along the way, we see tremendous opportunity to deploy that exact same technology stack in terms of a sensor-rich car, computationally rich car, um, that can really make an impact on safety. And this is our Guardian application. With Guardian, I think we view it very different than a lot of the other folks in the industry, where rather than thinking about enabling driver convenience at a level two, level three system, I would characterize those as we're using the human to guard the AI. We flip it around. We think about using the AI to guard the human, which we feel is a much better fit for the application. And so we think about with Guardian, basically it comes down to three things that sound simple, but in reality are hard to pull off uh, with a high level of uncertainty. Don't leave the road, don't hit anything, don't get hit. And we think about driver state monitoring in terms of understanding driver intent with also the external world around the vehicle. Our show, our, and ultimately the same technology stack, we think the first applications of where this will really truly realize, you know, human always as a passenger in the level four capability will probably come through as a mobility as a service application because it's just a, a very good fit from a technology standpoint with an actual business application. So in a mobility as a service, you can think about geofencing it. It fits basically the application that when you think of a, of a taxi-like service, right, you expect to have a, a pickup and a destination within a geofenced region of service. Um, we can think about basically uh, deploying where weather conditions are more favorable in terms of fencing it. As well as when you think about sensors, we can actually afford to basically put a lot of sensing and compute on these vehicles. And because the utilization is so much higher, like a taxi, we can get a return on investment and still have that be a profitable system. Whereas in personally owned vehicles, right, we think about basically a vehicle that's used about 5% of the time. Um, and we are trying to get at, uh, you know, basically an affordable price point that's for the, affordable to the consumer. Um, and so there's a lot more challenges that really need to be solved there. So we think some of the big questions going forward in terms of autonomy, technical challenges in terms of maintaining maps, adverse weather, interacting with people, um, for level two and level three approaches, you know, I think this whole question, right, of overtrust in the system and how do we maintain the vigilance of the human is a, is a significant one to overcome. Um, so for our guardian application, we, we flip that around and kind of think about really the, a human first driving with AI guarding the human. And for level four and level five approaches, right, can we get, really get near perfect faults, positive faults and negative rates to really realize uh, the deployment of these systems in the wild? And so I think in summary, you know, I think the potential for automated vehicles is great. This is why we're all here. This is why we're all excited. We see the future, right? Um, I think the idea has been a bit overhyped uh, in the media and the public's mind's eye of where we're really at and where, what does it really mean to deploy some of these systems in the near term? And I think, you know, human factors along with rigorous testing and validation will play a critical role in really how this technology is safely brought to market. And so with that, I'll conclude. <laughs>